I can sit at a desk quite easily for seven and a half hours twiddling my thumbs, doing nothing. My daughters, bless them, they can sit there for seven and a half hours just watching TikToks constantly and just look up for food every now and then. So it's not difficult to do that, right? Looking at what you're actually producing, what you're actually, what your outputs are, what activity you're actually taking during that period of time. Well, that's a different thing because you actually need to do something and achieve something. That's what we should be measuring against, right? <laughs> Now, one of the key things with performance is performance is subjective. It's not the same for everyone. So one of the key things we always get is, is not one size fits all. But the worst case scenario about this is you've got to just think about it for a minute. No one likes to be told that they're performing bad that you can't do your job properly. No one wants to have that information coming across to them. It has negative connotations and no one wants to hear it. So it's always subjective. What I believe is bad performance, you might actually disagree. Um, and, and that could happen with you and your staff. It's quite commonplace that when you come up to start tackling performance, that your staff just outright don't agree with your viewpoint of how their performance is taking place. You can think about things like, you know, if you had sickness cases or someone's been off sick um, for, I don't know, three weeks for whatever, migraines, I've got no idea. So if you assume someone's been off sick for a period of time, it's not really subjective. The person's been off sick. Um, that's quite clear. They've been signed off. You know they've been sick between that date and this day. That's clear. There's no argument about that, right? But with performance, it's not the same. It's not so black and white. It's not so clear cut. It is really subjective. And it is always in the eye of the beholder in that sense of things. I think sometimes as well, well, no, all the time, one of the things that's underestimated when it comes to managing performance is just how long it takes. Just how long managing staff performance actually takes you to actually work your way through from A to, to B or Z, whatever the case may be, from the point of identifying and informally managing a problem, a concern, to all the way to that person either picking up and reaching the standards that you need in the particular job to unfortunately it's not working and moving that person outside of your business. So it takes time to work your way through these. And what I would say is straight from the off, straight away, if you, if you have staff at the moment in time and you're having performance concerns and performance problems, one of the key things you may want to look at is how long they've been employed in your business. That may be a key component to how you're going to manage this particular process because of the time frames and the legal rights that are entitled to people when they hit that two-year mark for unfair dismissal. Now, I'm not saying that you should be looking at this in a different way. We always say that when you're managing performance, actually it works in your benefit that you're trying to help and support staff. And the reason for that is, and we'll come on to this in a minute, is because it costs so much money to go through a recruitment process. It's actually more cost effective to try and help and support someone that's all it's going to take to try and make these tweaks and, and things around the edges to help them to get to the standard you need to be, rather than just going through the process of just exiting people outside a revolving door and then just getting this turnstile of people coming in and going out. We want to make sure that we're working our way through that particular process in a right way and that we're looking at this from a supportive mechanism. That's the key component of what we're trying to do. I think the other key thing I want to talk about as well is that, you know, when it comes to managing performance, one of the key things I think that gets missed out quite a lot is that we're looking here, when we're talking about this, the same things when we're talking about setting targets and goals for your staff through your appraisals process. We're talking about setting actions, measuring against those actions for your staff. That's the key component that we're looking to try and achieve here. We're looking to see how we can measure what activity, what is the activity this person's meant to be completing right now? What's the output? What's the productivity that's meant to be set? I always say to people when they say, um, for example, I'm looking at people, they sit in their desk, they're meant to be here nine till five. How long did they take for lunch, et cetera, et cetera. I can sit at a desk quite easily for seven and a half hours twiddling my thumbs, doing nothing. My daughters, bless them, they can sit there for seven and a half hours just watching TikToks constantly and just look up for food every now and then. So it's not difficult to do that, right? 
looking at what you're actually producing, what you're actually, what your outputs are, what activity you're actually taking during that period of time. Well, that's a different thing because you actually need to do something and achieve something. That's what we should be measuring against, right? So performance, when you look at like any policy, most policies, if, I think all policies that I've come in contact with around performance management portrays the process as a very linear, a very straight line pathway that you've got to drive down and get yourself from the point of someone unfortunately having performance concerns and informally managing it all the way to some form of a conclusion, whatever the outcome is, whether it's persons able to reach the standards sustainably over a period of time and lo and behold, things have worked out, that's terrific, all the way to unfortunately it hasn't worked out and that person's going to exit your business. We want to make sure that we're very clear about this. We want to make sure that we're open about what this looks like, how this actually works in, pract in practical measures when you're actually doing it. Because if you go through, and you should be, we always say this, you should be looking at what your policies are saying and following your policies and procedures to effectively manage these processes, whether it be absence management, disciplinary investigations, performance management, you should be looking to follow those processes. But I think performance, for me, is the most profound one out of all of them that can really kick off and interrelate into lots of different policies, which means one core component. It's never really actually a straight line. This is a falsehood. It's not true. It will never really typically work out in this particular way. There are lots of obstacles that will be coming up and, uh, and you'll be coming up against all sorts of concerns that will bounce you into different things, which I'll come up to in one second. And I always think to myself, you know, when you start off a performance management process, it's almost like you're starting to open up a book. And it, this journey can go, this story is going to go multiple different ways. When you open up on page one, you don't know where it's going to go just yet. And it's kind of that unknown quantity. That's the one of the biggest things with performance. This is something that's going to evolve as you go down. That road can never stay straight if it's always going to be ever evolving, right? So this is reality. Reality is it ain't a road at all. It's really like a heartbeat. And you will be going and bouncing around all over the place because you are going into multiple different things, because it is such an evolving beast as you start to manage this problem within your teams, or within an individual within your team. OK, and this is one of the key things. This is a, a meism. This is a micism. I'm not saying this is how everyone will see this, but I imagine all these different processes as boxes. So which box am I in for which particular process? And with an individual, with an employee, when you're managing them, you can find yourself in multiple boxes all at the same time, which is groovy, right? That's an unused word for quite a period of time, groovy. So in terms of things, there are so many things that can happen as soon as you start managing performance. And this is where it darts around. So you can start off by managing performance, which, by the way, we've already said is really subjective, right? So it is really something that a person can disagree with you on. And all of a sudden, when you go down the road of managing performance, lo and behold, maybe, just maybe, they get really upset with you for the process of going down that. No one likes to be told that they're bad at their job, right? So all of a sudden, they feel they're being bullied and harassed by their line manager. You're picking on them. You are targeting them because you're managing their performance. So all of a sudden, you fall into the grievance and bullying harassment box there. And lo and behold, now you've got an investigation for bullying harassment. Then all of a sudden, somewhere down that road, they're not happy. And all of a sudden, they're, they're stressed. Quite rightfully so. I'm not disingenuously saying they're not stressed. It's not they're stressed. They're stressed because work-related stress. They are upset. They are under pressure. And they are stressed in the workplace. And all of a sudden, they go sick. And they're signed off sick for work-related stress. And now you can't manage performance because the person is in the office. They're off sick. And you've got all these connotations that could come up. You could even find someone then, lo and behold, because of that, because of their, um, you know, the fact they so disagree with you and what you're doing and how you're progressing with different bits and pieces, that they do things that are deliberately wrong, that end up actually falling into being a conduct issue. I think one of the common themes I always use as an example of this, um, which we, we tend to use actually to kind of distinguish as to whether is it a performance issue or is it a conduct issue? And this is an actual case I actually did have um, previously is when we had a medical secretary 
And the medical secretary um, was originally, they were managing her uh, for performance. The performance issue they were having was that she wouldn't answer the telephone. Secretary that wouldn't answer a telephone. Now, that isn't a case of she couldn't answer the telephone. She wasn't trained how to answer a telephone. It was a straight up normal telephone. Everything was in place. She'd gone through that whole process. It was a conduct issue because she was willfully not wanting to answer the telephone. It, was, it wasn't a performance issue whatsoever. But you can find yourself where you're going through these pathways. And as you start to explore, so we said this is an evolving beast. As things start to unravel, as you start to go through this process, you can find yourself in multiple different areas. And with that, obviously, you could find yourself in about four, maybe eventually five boxes, all simultaneously at the same time with one person. And this is why we always come back to with, with managers, if you own a business, if you're employing staff, this is a headache. This is a nightmare. This isn't something you want to be doing. This is going to take, not only is it going to take six, 12 months plus to kind of manage your way through this process, it's going to take so much of your physical time in the workplace on solely one person to actually manage through this process. And that's the thing I think is so underspoken about when people start as a new employer is exactly how much it just takes one person. It doesn't take three, four or five. It takes one person that can potentially cause you no end of pain and problems and concerns to work your way through. Not pains and concerns, just kind of categorizing this in case I kind of like spook people in some way, not as in they're a pain or a concern, but in terms of your time. Because as a manager, as an owner of a business, your time is so valuable and where you're spending it, it means so much. So if you're spending it all in one place, it's not a good use of your time. That's going to be a pain and a headache because of all the other things you also need to kind of concentrate on, right? So you want to identify the issue. And like we said before, for me, one of the things that's not on there, but one of the core things is looking at identifying actions, outputs. What is the productivity? Measure that. How are they hitting those objectives? What are the objectives? You know, how, how often are we meeting with them? What support is in place? We want to identify what the issue actually is. Like I said before, we're not looking at a conduct issue. We're looking at genuine performance related issues it should be things that are related to their role god damn it absolutely why not you don't want to start looking at a manager of a team and start performance managing them because they're not making tea or something ridiculous and absurd that's not related to their role it has to be a reasonable instruction it has to be something that's reasonable within the sphere of the job they're meant to be doing that you're measuring against and we always say these last two kind of interrelate you want to be able to demonstrate what that problem is that's not always easy, depending on what job it is that you're managing, by the way. But you want to be able to, where possible, demonstrate the problem, and you want to be able to document what those problems are. And the reason for that is, again, it comes back to that very first point that we went through. Managing performance is subjective. It's subjective. So if you have something that can demonstrate what you're saying, demonstrate what your concerns are, why you have those concerns. Here's another one. We had a client recently, and um, part of their concerns was uh, the performance. It was a, a makeup studio, and the performance of, of a member of staff that obviously with the services that are offering, you may be able to tell by looking at me, I'm not an expert in makeup. But when they were going through those particular processes, it was having a significant impact on the clients and therefore having a significant impact on the business. To boot with that, they were also having quite significant lateness issues. So attendance and lateness, which is a conduct thing. All of which, two boxes, remember, had a huge impact on the employer, had a huge impact on their clients and the business they were running. And, you know, you're not taking pictures of the people and the makeup issues. So you've got to document, you've got to demonstrate what the problems are. What are the complaints? What are the concerns that are coming back? How frequently have you been discussing with this person? This is just something that's popped out of the blue. Now, all of a sudden, you're looking to go straight through to a, a formal warning of some sort. Remember that straight line? And so you go through that straight line in a performance process. You're looking at informal, and then you're going through pretty much mirroring what your disciplinary processes may be. So around about maybe a written warning, maybe a final written warning before you're getting to the point of a dismissal process. You don't want to jump straight in it, you know, and, and, and go straight to dismissal process 
you've got to work your way through those mechanisms. That's why it takes so long, right, to get yourself through those processes. So you want to be going, you're going in and you're going in at the very early stages of informal. And, and you want to start off by documenting and demonstrating. Informal can be a one-to-one -one meeting. It could be a one-to-one -one meeting that you're holding weekly, bi-weekly, monthly. But you want to, at every stage, be explaining what those concerns are, why it's a concern, and what you can do to help and support that person to overcome those concerns. We're going to come on to this in a minute as well. But you've got to remember, every time, if you haven't started this process yet, and this is the most common theme, managers will, I know there's a problem. I know there's an issue, but I'm not going to deal with it right now and hope that it will resolve itself. And it doesn't. And it gets to a point where they've got to kind of do something, right? You've got to take something forward. And then when they start doing it, because they're so fed up with it, it's been going on for three months, Michael, something on those sort of lines, all of a sudden they want to jump up that yardstick and all of a sudden it's, it's a final written warning kind of an issue. But they've never done anything informally first. You've got to work your way through. You've got to imagine before you walk into the next garden, you've got to clear all the mess up in the first one first before you can go through the gate to the next one. And that's what we always try and say to, to our clients is think about where you are within this process. And if you're just starting, even though you've been experiencing it for three, six months, whatever the case may be, you're starting from ground zero. You're starting from step one, not step six. Step one, it's your fault you've not taken those steps earlier, right? But you've got to be showing the whole way through. Demonstrate the problem, document how you're talking and helping them to solve the problems that you're even discussing the problems in the first place and working your way through to show the support and to also measure the impact that support is having on that person's in particular issues around their performance. So this is the performance gap. So what we're trying to demonstrate here is, I, I, I it's a weird kind of way of doing it on here, but what I tend to do is, is I say, that if the job is kind of to a certain level and the person isn't filling all of that, so if you imagined, I don't know, like you're filling up a cup and if you filled it up, that's ultimate performance and the person's kind of like a third of the way up, then between those two levels is the gap. That's the gap in performance. And one of the common themes that tends to happen with managers typically is you start to take functions away from the job. So another example that we had was a, um, a manager in a GP practice. And the manager, obviously, it was a significant role. It's a big role within the practice. Um, and it has a lot, a lot of functions that it has to cover. It's a very difficult role. There's no two ways about it. But the person that was filling it couldn't complete and focus on all the areas of the role at the times when they were meant to. It basically, they, they couldn't manage their time and there were functions that they couldn't do. And in that sense of things, it meant that as soon as you focused on one area that was going bad and they then focused on it and got it to good, because they focused on that, another area went bad and then it got added onto the list, the things we had to look at. But what we don't want to do is say, well, they can't do all these functions or they're struggling with this one. So let's take that away. Let's take this away from, I don't know, Betty. Betty's going to lose this. Oh, where did Betty come from, by the way, on that one, Jack? I don't know. But... Um, we're going to take this. We're going to take this off of her shoulders. She can't fulfil this function right now, so we're going to take it away. Right? Well, you've just reduced what the actual functionality of that job is. You've got a job in your business. You've got a role that's there to fulfil a particular output. Activities need to be done by that role. If you take it away from that particular post, where it's got to go somewhere, the activity and the work doesn't disappear. It's got to go somewhere. What's the impact on the team? What's the impact on the morale? And if you're reducing the level of the job, then what you're doing is you're saying, we've hired somebody, and rather than hiring somebody to fill a role that we need to have done, we're going to now just mold and reduce the role to the person we hired. But you've still got all these other things that need to be done too. Yet you're still going to be paying the same amount of money for that person to do less of a job. So what we want to do is make sure we're identifying that gap. The gap is the difference between that person's level of performance and what the minimum level of performance, what good looks like, not perfect, not a superstar, what the bare minimum of output and, and activity within your job description that person needs to do in their particular role. 
That's the key component that we're looking here. What is that gap? Because that's the bit that we need to focus on. So how do we get that person now, if we identify that, how do we get them to move up that ladder? How do we support them to grow from being where they are to where they need to be so the full functionality of that role eventually is being filled? That's the key component. And we need to look at, <clears throat> as a manager, it's our responsibility. And I'll come on to this in a minute. But how do we, how do we offer support that can help that person? And you need to work with them. You won't have all the answers. What things do they feel they need to help them, to help them to be able to reach those standards? Do they need more training? Um, is it because they rely on third parties coming back for particular work and it's not happening and that's holding them back from being able to complete, you know, certain bits of what they're meant to do? What is it? How does that look? And what support can I put in place? And I think it's really important that you realize there's limitations to what you can and can't do. So you can't do everything. You can't you can't solve everything. You don't have a smoking gun form of support that's going to just, that's it, annihilated that performance issue. We solved it. It's not going to work that way. There will be, you know, for example, having regular one-to-ones with staff. That's a form of support. Putting in additional training is a form of support. Doing a buddying system where they get to work with other people within your teams to help to increase their, their activity, to increase what they're doing. Um, and their outputs and, and, and all those different bits and pieces, that's a form of support. You know, all these things are forms of support, including if the person has um, ill health concerns that are leading to poor performance. There are forms of support you can put in place there. Are there any reasonable adjustments? Those are all forms of support. But you can exhaust all those forms of support, right? And then there isn't anything more that you can do. Um, but the key component here is it does matter. It absolutely matters to try and focus on this issue. If not for the first thing we spoke about a minute ago, which is managers kind of sit on it, hoping it will resolve itself. And then when it becomes such a big problem, it's been going on for such a long time, they want to fast track the process. And you can't. You start from square one, right? So it matters to actually do it in a timely way because you're suffering this process. And that person, bless them, isn't getting the support they need in that role for a longer period of time. So you need to actually focus on it and do something about it. Of course you do. But it's your responsibility. It is your responsibility to take that forward. If you've hired somebody and they've been with you for, I don't know, let's say four years. And, you know, the role is they're just struggling. Something's happened. Something's taken place. You know, it's your responsibility. You're the one that's keeping them there you're the one that needs to help and give them solutions and support to help them to meet the standard you're needing them to make, to understand what's happened. You know, if they've been with us for four years, is something, something suddenly occurred that now is causing these particular concerns? Well, what is it? It's up to you to get involved and to get into that and to find out what could be happening. But you need to accept the fact that there has to be a conclusion. There has to be an end game to this process. We're looking ultimately where there's a performance concern to support first, to help people to reach the standards that you need them to reach and to manage through that process as quickly as we can. But you need to accept that if they can't reach that standard that's required, then you need to take that decision that potentially that person isn't right for your business or right for that role. Another thing we always talk about here is wrong person, wrong role, wrong business. You could have someone who's the wrong person in the wrong role. So you may need to look at that. They could be ultimately the wrong person in the wrong role and in the wrong business. And you need to look at that too. But the key thing here is, is you need to be taking action to get to an outcome. This isn't just an endless journey. It's not an evolving pathway that you walk down forever and ever and ever. It has to have a definitive outcome and solution at some point. House music.